Hello and welcome to the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network's webinar, Mount St. Helens and the Cascade Range Volcanoes. It's on the occasion of the 40th anniversary, May 18th, 2020, of the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. My name is Harold Tobin. I'm the director of the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, or PNSN, and also a professor in the Earth and Space Sciences Department at the University of Washington. The PNSN is an organization that is run by both the University of Washington and the University of Oregon in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey, and our mission is to monitor earthquakes and seismic hazards in the region. We have a fantastic program for you tonight. I'm so excited to have these four top volcano experts from the Pacific Northwest region here to discuss what happened back in 1980, what our Cascade volcanoes are really all about, and what the status of monitoring of those volcanoes and understanding those hazards are today. The four speakers will make their presentations and it will last about an hour and a half in total or just a little bit less. At that point, we'll invite you, if you'd like, to join us on Facebook Live for a live question and answer session following their very interesting and information-packed presentations. We're really fortunate to have these four speakers tonight. First up in our program is going to be Professor Jackie Kaplan Auerbach, a seismologist from Western Washington University, who is also the Associate Dean of the College of Science and Engineering there. Jackie's gonna give us the big picture overview of kind of how Cascade volcanoes fit into plate tectonics and basic understanding of where, what our volcanoes are all about here. After Jackie's finished, she's gonna be followed up by Professor Joe Dufek from the University of Oregon. Joe is an expert in volcano processes and volcano science, and he is going to really cover the hazards that come from these cascade type volcanoes and the range of those hazards across the range. After Joe's done, then we're going to have kind of the heart of this presentation in a way, which is retired professor Steve Malone from the University of Washington. Steve was the seismologist who was responsible in many ways for understanding what was going on at Mount St. Helens leading up to that eruption 40 years ago. And Steve's going to give us his sort of perspective on the history of what took place back in 1980 and what lessons it has for understanding natural disasters and hazards today. And finally, Seth Moran, Dr. Seth Moran, who is the director of the Cascade Volcano Observatory of the U.S. Geological Survey, will present for us uh, the status of Mount St. Helens ever since that 1980 eruption, including a period from 2004 to 2008 when the volcano became very active again. Seth will also finish up by telling us about modern day, present day monitoring and how far we've come since 1980. I think the program is going to be fantastic. It's going to be really informative. And whether you know a lot about volcanoes or not very much at all, there'll be something to interest you in this program. So without further ado, we'll turn to the first part of our program, Dr. Jackie kaplan Auerbach from Western Washington University. So my name is Jackie kaplan Auerbach, and I'm a professor at Western Washington University. And I'm going to start us off today by talking about the setting for our volcanoes here in the Pacific Northwest. So in particular, I'm going to talk about plate tectonics and how that controls the volcanoes that we have and some of the behaviors that they exhibit, such as you see here in this photo of the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. So I want to start off by asking you to think about what do you picture in your head when you think about a volcano? This photo here is Bellingham, Washington, where I live, and you might be able to see Mount Baker volcano behind us on the horizon. So maybe if you live here in Cascadia, maybe what you picture are volcanoes like this, these large mountains, kind of these cone-shaped features, like Mount Rainier or, of course, St. Helens. Maybe you've had seen Mount Fuji in Japan. Maybe you've seen other volcanoes like this that have that kind of conical shape. You might picture explosive eruptions. You might picture ash and things like that. But you might also picture something different. You might imagine something like the lava flows that we see in Hawaii that tend to be less explosive but a lot runnier and can be damaging in other ways. I want to talk a little bit about why we get these different behaviors. And all of this fits in the context of something we call plate tectonics. So when we talk about tectonic plates, we're talking about the very shallowest layer of the Earth. And that's where it's kind of brittle and cold, and those, the outer layer behaves in a rigid manner. Even though most of the Earth is solid, that top, upper portion is just a little more rigid. And those plates actually move across the Earth relative to each other, sometimes toward each other, sometimes apart or sliding past. And at some of those plate boundaries, that's where we get volcanic activity. So you're looking at a figure here that shows our tectonic setting in Cascadia. And you can see that we've got a number of different plates. All of us presenting in this video today are sitting on the North American plate. Offshore of us 
is a boundary between two other plates. The Juan de Fuca plate is actually moving away from the Pacific plate at what's called a mid-ocean ridge, and it's diving beneath us here in North America in what's called a subduction zone. Volcanoes occur in both of these environments. Where plates move apart, the solid mantle actually rises up to fill the gap, and that rising process causes some of it to melt, and that produces magma. We get the same thing at things that are called hot spots that are actually not near tectonic plates, but that's the kind of process that produces Hawaii, where solid mantle material rises up and melts when it gets near the surface. In a subduction zone, though, things are a little bit different. So if we zoom in on that process here, the plate that's diving down, in this case the, the Juan de Fuca plate beneath North America, used to be the ocean floor. And as a consequence, it has water in it. it has water within the rock and within the sediment and, and within the very minerals that are inside it. That water, when it dives down beneath this other plate, interacts with the overriding mantle, and it causes that mantle to melt. That melt then rises up and produces our cascade volcanoes. That also has an impact on the behavior of volcanoes, because the thing that makes volcanoes erupt isn't the heat or the pressure. The thing that makes volcanoes erupt are bubbles. There are gases dissolved within the magma that drive the eruption, very much like the carbon dioxide in a soda rips that soda out of the bottle when you drop a mento in it. So the gases that are in volcanic environments are actually mostly water. There's a little bit of carbon dioxide, there's sulfur gases as well, but ultimately the primary driving force of volcanic eruptions is water dissolved in magma. How explosively that volcano erupts depends on a couple of things. Number one, it depends on how much gas there is. If you blow a little bit of air into your milk, you might get small bubbles. If you blow a lot, you might get larger bubbles of bubbles that get out more vigorously. But it also depends on what material those bubbles are in. If you do that same blowing of bubbles in a milkshake, it's a lot stickier. And when that bubble comes out, it's going to tear some of the milk out with it. It's going to pull some of that material and erupt a little more explosively. So, that's pretty much what we have here at our different plate tectonic boundaries. Where plates move apart and that mantle rises, it turns out that the mantle doesn't have a lot of water in it on its own. And so when that lava comes up, it doesn't tend to have a lot of gases dissolved and you tend to get these oozy, runny lavas. You get that where plates move apart and you get that at these hot spots like Hawaii. In contrast, at a subduction zone, you've actually got a lot of water being carried down beneath the overriding plate so the magma that forms has a lot of water within it, and that gas can drive very explosive eruptions. So we can see both of those different types of activity at these different areas. So let's look a little more at Cascadia itself. So this is a figure that's showing all the volcanoes in the American portion of the Cascades and how they've erupted over the past 4,000 years. So each of these little volcano icons is a time when we think the volcano acted up. And you can see that volcanoes themselves behave in a really different manner. Some erupt a lot. In fact, Mount St. Helens is sort of our most active volcano in the whole arc. Others don't seem to do much at all. You can see Mount Jefferson has not erupted at all in that historic time. If we zoom in on the last, say, 500 years, this dashed line that you see here in red shows the last 200. In those past 500 years or so, really virtually all the activity has been either in Washington or down in Northern California, very little in Central Oregon. And in fact, it turns out that we see different behaviors across the Cascade Arc. There are these segmented sections of the arc that have different chemistries, have different eruptive styles, and we really see different behaviors in all these regions. That's in part because the plate that subducts is itself very different. In some places it's older, in others it's younger. We think the temperature of the mantle differs. So there are sort of these complexities that go into this as well. Why do we care about that? We care because volcanoes have personality. Each volcano has its own character. Each one has it's something of a creature of habit. It may erupt in the same manner over and over again. And in order to know if a signal is alarming in a volcano, we have to know what normal is. So we have to study each volcano to say, what is its normal background activity? And when do we get alarmed? When do we get concerned? So with that in mind, let's kind of look at one particular parameter that gives us a window into volcanic activity. And I'm going to look at earthquakes. I'm a volcano seismologist by trade, so that's sort of my, the tool that I use. But it's also a pretty good one for evaluating what volcanoes are doing. 
So this is a map of Mount Baker Volcano here at the north end of the American Cascades. And these are all the earthquakes that have ever been recorded within that volcano. I've actually just kind of taken a 10 kilometer radius around the summit. So there are other earthquakes that are probably not shown on this map because I wanted to focus not on the ones that were within the crust, but the ones that were within the volcanic system. We can look at this as a map, or we can look at this as a cross section. And what you're looking here now is you're looking down into the earth and that kind of orangey line on the top is the topography. And we see up here, not only does Mount Baker kind of have this just handful of earthquakes over the past 50 years, but most of them are pretty deep, deep within the crust, which is not actually considered to be the magmatic system for Mount Baker. It may actually have to do with recharge from the subduction zone, but really we're not completely certain what these earthquakes indicate. We do know that Mount Baker has very little happening within its cone itself. Let's go to the south to the next volcano along, and here's Glacier Peak. You can see that similarly in a 10 kilometer radius around Glacier Peak, there's been almost nothing over the course of those 50 years. And if we look at a cross section there, really there's not even these deep earthquakes. Now for both Mount Baker and Glacier Peak, we should put a little asterisk on this, and that's because they don't have a lot of seismic stations sitting on the volcano itself. So in order for an earthquake to be picked up, it's got to be recorded by stations that are regional, that are deployed kind of around the state. So probably we have to have them of a size maybe a one and a half to two magnitude to see them. Those are still really small, but there's a chance there are little tiny ones that we're missing. Still, we can be pretty confident that if these were to act up, we would probably see an increase in earthquakes, and that would be the signal that something had changed. So let's go one more south and let's take a look at Mount Rainier Volcano. Once again, 10 kilometer radius, and this is a very different beast. This is normal background activity for Mount Rainier. Turns out this is not a signal that's alarming because we understand the volcano and we've seen it for a lot of years. Mount Rainier has a lot of seismic activity. If we look at a cross section through this, we can see these are all really shallow. These are in just the, the top, top couple kilometers. That tells us a couple of things. Number one, it turns out that a lot of the earthquakes on Mount Rainier have to do with the ice that's flowing on its surface, the glaciers. Some of it is slipping ice. Some of it has to do with water that percolates into the edifice that then becomes heated up and we get hydrothermal activity. But we know that this is not an alarming signal because it's the normal signal. It's the one we've been recording again for about 50 years on Mount Rainier. So understanding what normal is for a volcano is really critical so that we can identify what is a change in the signal and what causes us to be alarmed. And so I want you to kind of keep that in mind as we start talking about the, the sequence that led up to eruptions of Mount St. Helens. Thanks very much, Jackie, for that fantastic short summary presentation of, of the setting of our Cascade Volcanoes. Now we're gonna to turn to Joe Dufek, who is a University of Oregon professor, but also a graduate of the University of Washington where he got his bachelor's and master's degrees in the Earth and Space Sciences Department. Joe is going to explain to us the hazards from the Cascade Volcanoes. Good evening. My name is Joe Dufek. I'm a professor at the University of Oregon, and I'm really happy to have the opportunity to talk to you this evening about some of the lessons we've learned about volcanic hazards, both before and after the May 18th, 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. One of the really fascinating things about volcanoes is that they really embody the extremes and dynamic behavior. At one moment, you can have a lava flow that's moving so sluggishly that you could probably outwalk it. At another moment, you can have an explosion that has flows that move the speed of sound, or even faster. As you can imagine, with these different behaviors come a variety of challenges when thinking about volcanic hazards. The diagram on the left indicates a variety of hazards that could present themselves during an eruption in the Cascades. Any one eruption may include a number of these hazards, or only a few, or one. And we've learned from looking at deposits of past eruptions that each eruption is different and each volcano has a unique history or personality. The diagram on the left indicates that when magma sourced from depth reaches the near surface, it can either erupt passively or effusively and produce lava flows, or it can break up or fragment and explode producing pyroclastic material, which is mostly composed of volcanic ash. This ash mixed with volcanic gases mostly water vapor and carbon dioxide, can either rise if it remains lower density than the surrounding atmosphere, or collapse and form a type of hot pyroclastic avalanche, referred to as a pyroclastic density current, 
or pyroclastic flow. The ash that reaches high in the atmosphere can cause significant downwind effects. These include respiratory problems associated with inhaling fine volcanic ash, agricultural effects associated with the deposition of ash, large eruptions can modify the amount of sunlight that can filter through, as well as produce sulfur aerosols that can modify the atmospheric energy balance. And this fine ash in the atmosphere can also cause aviation hazards, as the ash can cause problems with jet engine turbines. Just a quick note on this volcanic ash, it is essentially quenched volcanic glass of small size, so you should really be picturing small fragments of glass rather than organic material that you might experience, say, from a forest fire. Magma that is viscous and has less dissolved gas can form volcanic domes, which we will hear more about later. These domes are typically confined to the volcanic crater, but can themselves become gravitationally unstable and produce pyroclastic flows. During explosions, large material can also be ejected from the crater and is depicted here with the label volcanic bombs. Here the bomb is only a reference to the size of these class, being larger than 64 millimeters. Finally, one of the most important hazards for volcanoes in the Cascades comes from the interaction of hot magma with hydrological conditions on our Cascade volcanoes, including groundwater and ice and snow that often caps the peaks in the Cascades. Rapid production of meltwater with unconsolidated volcanic material, both from an ongoing eruption or past eruptions, can produce a type of mud flow called a lahar. Lahars are very mobile floods that can carry a lot of volcanic debris and can cause significant damage to downstream watersheds and population centers. On the right we see a diagram of the Cascade volcanoes depicted as red triangles and the relationship to the subduction zone which we heard about from Jackie. From this diagram you get a sense that many of the population centers in the Pacific Northwest are within relative proximity to the volcanoes of the Cascades. Similar to other regions in the Pacific Northwest, volcanoes shape a large fraction of the landscape of Oregon, and the prominent peaks of the Cascade volcanoes are particularly striking examples of this. Here we see some examples of these iconic peaks, including Crater Lake, Mount Hood, and the Three Sisters. Remnants of past eruptions are abundant, including this lava deposit just outside Bend. So much of what we know about eruptive behavior comes from an analysis of looking at deposits, like this pyroclastic density current deposit, shown with a hammer for scale. From these analysis of these deposits, we can then assess the likelihood of future activity, as well as combining it with information like Jackie discussed, such as the seismic behavior and other geophysical indicators. This map indicates, again, the Cascade volcanoes, but here the color scheme indicates centers that are most likely to erupt in the future based upon an analysis of these deposits, but also thinking about some of the geophysical indicators that, that Jackie discussed. And this map was recently updated by the USGS. In individual cases, like if we zoom into one volcano, here we're looking at a hazard map of Mount Hood, we can see that there are a variety of different hazards that you might want to consider when looking at these volcanoes. And it's not necessarily likely that all these hazards will come up during a single event, but this is just assessing the, the hazard associated with different, different sorts of activity. So you see here in the, the sort of reddish region near the volcano, there's a greater likelihood of, of lava flows and pyroclastic flows, and then kind of regional lava flows shown in this kind of tan colored area. The lahars here are shown in the kind of more red and yellowish color schemes here, and this is to indicate that, in, that they're following more basically watersheds. And what's not shown on this particular map are, are airfall uh, hazards, hazards from ash falling uh, due, to, due to ash getting up into the atmosphere. And to assess that, Certainly past deposits are considered, as well as numerical models of, of ash dispersal. So going back to thinking about the subduction zone, as Jackie mentioned, a lot of the activity generated in this region is associated with volatiles coming off the subducting slab, causing melting. So this melt that's produced has a lot of gas in it, as Jackie mentioned. And this gives rise to certain activity that uh, tends to make these eruptions in general more explosive than you might see at Hawaii or other volcanic locations. So this map here shows a, a photograph of the May 18, 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens that Steve's going to tell us a lot more about. Overlain with that is a cartoon of the conduit system, so what's going on below ground. And then I'm illustrating here on this slide a variety of kind of critical moments in this explosive volcanic eruption that kind of set the stage for all the behavior that happens. In this particular case, you have volatiles that are exsolving here, water vapor and carbon dioxide forming bubbles that creates a buoyant mixture of, of gas, 
plus the melt that rises. It further decompresses. You get more gases exsolving. And this positive feedback cycle keeps going until the magma fragments or breaks up and explodes. Then that magma, now volcanic ash primarily, and gas mixture accelerates up to the speed of sound as it exits the vent and then can go supersonic in the atmosphere beyond the vent. Uh, if it entrains a lot of background atmospheric air, it will become buoyant and rise high up into the atmosphere, like some flows did at Mount St. Helens. And certainly there are also collapsing events like pyroclastic density currents that we'll talk a lot more about in, in a moment here. Because of the difficulties observing active volcanic systems, we are still learning a great deal from the deposits of Mount St. Helens. And in fact, recent erosion has exposed deposits from the pyroclastic flows in the pumice plain in greater three-dimensional structure than we could previously view. The eruption of Mount St. Helens included a number of hazards that I mentioned previously, including a strong lateral blast, fragmented ash being injected into plumes, and pyroclastic density currents that inundated the surrounding landscape. Ash dispersal in the atmosphere spread ash over large fractions of the western U.S. and was particularly concentrated just downwind of the volcano, and mud flows also inundated watersheds immediately downstream of Mount St. Helens. If volcanoes have a personality, Mount St. Helens is a particularly rambunctious one. Prior to the 1980 eruption, studies focusing on deposits indicated a long history of magmatic activity. Most notable among these works is the report of Crandall and Mono in 1978. On this graph, quiescent periods are denoted by bars and eruptions with circles. Note the repeated instances of dome growth, lava flows, pyroclastic flows, and mud flows in the preceding centuries. The hot avalanches or granular flows I mentioned previously, pyroclastic flows, also known as pyroclastic density currents, such as the example shown here, are a particularly devastating phenomena for structures and populations near volcanoes because they are ground-hugging but particularly mobile. This video from a pyroclastic density current generated by a dome collapse in Japan illustrates just how mobile these currents are. They typically move at tens of meters per second and while they follow the ground, they are comprised of hot gases and particles, and enough of these particles or ash is deposited out of them, they will undergo a density reversal and take off into the atmosphere as plumes. These flows have a complex internal structure, and when we video pyroclastic flows, we usually only see the dilute outer edge. A cross-section like this cartoon illustrates that in some flows, the concentration of particles increases rapidly at the base of the flows and contains most of the energy and mass. Because they are fast-moving, dangerous, and virtually impossible to see into, scientists have devoted much time and energy into conducting alternative investigations to see into these flows. For example, geophysical signals like infrasound or low-frequency sound and, and seismic waves have been used as indicators of pyroclastic flow activity. But still, a lot of work is needed to understand what is actually generating the details of these signals. Large-scale experiments, like this one by colleagues in New Zealand, have been used to better understand the internal structure of pyroclastic density currents. This video illustrates the flows produced by these experiments, which can then be monitored and studied using thermal and pressure sensors and high-speed video. These experiments reveal much of the details of how volcanic gases stay contained in pyroclastic density currents and fluidize them. This fluidization, or essentially air cushion, is somewhat analogous to the effect you see with an air hockey table and lets the flows go much further than you would otherwise expect. Another technique now employed to study the internal dynamics of pyroclastic density currents are computational approaches, much like how weather simulations are used to study the dynamics of storms in the atmosphere. This particular simulation shows the concentration of particles in the same experimental setup we saw previously. Here in this cross-section, red is a higher concentration region of the flow. This combination of experiments, computational approaches, and geophysics can all be combined with an understanding of volcanic deposits and other observations to help us better uh, appreciate how pyroclastic density current hazards may come into play in the future. Parallel efforts similar to those I have described for pyroclastic density currents are underway to understand a particularly notable hazard in the Pacific Northwest, lahars. The combination of volcanic heat, poorly consolidated material, and abundant meltwater on the Cascade volcanoes are ideal conditions for producing lahars. Lahars are particularly dangerous because they follow drainages and can reach far beyond the volcano. A very notable local example is Mount Rainier, which has previously produced some very large lahars. Here we see a USGS hazard map with a lahar hazard indicated again in the sliding red to yellow scale along the drainages reaching all the way to the sound. A video of a lahar from Mount Rupehu in New Zealand indicates the dynamics of these high energy and mobile flows. 
The abundant debris in these flows gives them added mass and energy, and they have the potential to inundate low-lying areas rapidly and impact infrastructure. Hence, there has been a lot of effort to conduct experiments of sediment, ice, and water interacting, improving surveillance efforts and sensor uh, efforts along potential lahar paths, and simulations to consider a range of lahar scenarios. The eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980 was a watershed event in our understanding of volcanic hazards, giving us a wealth of information during the event and continuing today as we better document the deposits of this eruption. It contained numerous volcanic hazards from pyroclastic density currents to ashfall events, and really illustrated how complex these events can be, and illustrated the impact of cascading hazards on local populations. Next up in our program is the part that perhaps you've all been waiting for in some ways, which is Steve Malone giving us a real sense of what it was like back in the spring of 1980, the state of the art of volcano seismology and volcano science, and what took place leading up to that eruption. Well, hello. This seems very strange to me talking to a computer rather than a bunch of people, which I normally do for talks. Something else I should probably mention right up front is my hairstyle. Well, maybe it's in keeping with 40 years ago. That's the way I looked. Of course, back then, that was the style. Now it's just I can't get to a barber. I think I'm going to not get to a barber until we're turned loose and can do that again. Before I get started with the presentation, a little background. Back in 1980, I was a, a researcher professor at the University of Washington in the seismology group that was relatively small, a few professors, a few students, technician or two. And we didn't have a lot of experience dealing with the press or the public. I'd been working on various research projects, one at Mount Baker in 1975 when the steaming activity went on there. It didn't lead to any volcanic activity. And had worked at Mount St. Helens and Mount Rainier studying what we thought were volcanic earthquakes. Turned out to be they were glacier events. But that all changed in 1980. That strange time in which I went from being just a pure research seismologist and teacher to someone who started interacting with the civil authorities and the public very rapidly. It was baptism by fire. Of course, Mount St. Helens was known at that time as sort of the, the Fujiyama of the West. Very nice and symmetrical shaped, a beautiful cone, lovely forests around it, particularly on the north side, Spirit Lake. There was really nothing expected except that its geologic history indicated it was a very active volcano. And one study indicated it might even erupt before the end of the century. And of course, that quiet was broken actually in March, March 20th, of 1980, an earthquake occurred, in this case is shown the recording at a station near Mount Rainier, that immediately got our attention. I was working in my office one afternoon, March 20th, and the seismic analyst came dashing in and said a big earthquake had just taken place down somewhere near Mount St. Helens. So I went downstairs where our recording facilities were, and at that time we had these old drum recorders where there's a piece of paper that slowly rotates and a pen scratches out a seismogram on it. And in the background here, you see film recorders. These are called the velocorders because film slowly goes through them. And after some time, it gets automatically developed and we can look at the seismograms on it. Well, while a colleague and I were sort of arguing about this earthquake because it hadn't been developed yet, the analyst started working and picking arrivals off of that after developing it, punching up punch cards, carrying them up to the computer center, running them through the program that then would locate the earthquake. And after about a half an hour, we had the answer. Indeed, it was an earthquake right at Mount St. Helens. Pretty big size, about magnitude 4, 4.2. What to do? Well, it turns out uh, my colleague, Craig Weaver, who works for the US Geological Survey, who was in our lab at that spring to work on a project together, we had some portable seismographs that had just arrived. So we decided we would go out the next day and install those down near the mountain. Those instruments look sort of like this. They're tape recording on slow moving tape. The tape will last about five days. Instruments are buried near there, it runs off a battery. But those tapes have to be changed every five days and then brought back to the lab to be read. And so they're not real time. And I asked my technician if he couldn't put together additional telemetered stations, ones that send the data back to the lab. 
this is an example of one that is currently now on Glacier Peak, in which a sensor is buried in the ground nearby. There's a box that has electronics in it and some batteries. And then you see the mask with a solar panel and antenna. So this seismograph actually sends the data via radio or looking into a telephone link back to the lab in real time. So with those installed, we can actually watch what's going on as it occurs. Well, after installing the portable instruments there on Friday the 21st, the day after the first earthquake, I drove up to the Timberline parking lot just about dusk to look at the mountain. And it looked calm. There were a few places where there might be avalanche tracks, but not much. And a fellow was there that worked for the Forest Service, and he and I got to chatting about earthquakes and volcanoes. And I said, you know, this is the type of thing you might expect to occur when a volcano is getting ready to erupt. It'll be interesting because if the seismicity dies out, the earthquakes become fewer over time, it'll be a main shock aftershock sequence. But if they build up, that's a typical type of precursor to an eruption. Well, back in the lab over the next several days, here's the seismogram from a station that we had installed at Spirit Lake. Now, we didn't see these data at that time. We saw other real-time ones, but the records from those are much harder to interpret. But we could see that there was a change in the data. And you can see this starts early on the 22nd, basically midnight, when after we had finished installing the station, and it goes for several days. And it's pretty obviously that there's a few earthquakes, these little blurps here and there, these are earthquakes. There were a few early on, and then sometime on the 23rd, 24th, the activity increased. And by sometime on the 25th, it was obvious that these events were not decreasing in number, but actually increasing. Well, this definitely got our attention. This is Monday the 25th. First thing that morning, I called the U.S. Geological Survey's Volcano Hazards Office that's located in Denver, and I talked with Rocky Crandall, the man that really understood the volcanic hazards the best at Mount St. Helens. And after some discussion, I convinced him that we had an earthquake swarm going on at St. Helens that if it increased, certainly looked to me that it would lead to a possible eruption. He said, okay, well, he agreed and sent one of his colleagues that had worked with him a lot, a fellow named Don Molino, out to Vancouver, where the Forest Service headquarters for the area are located. And the Forest Service is the land manager for Mount St. Helens, and so an appropriate location, they put him up there. Well, the following day, the word had gotten out to the news media that something was going on, and our labs at the university became inundated with reporters both print and television. And here I am trying to analyze these data, make plans for additional stations, and at the same time, try to interpret this for the public. Well, I was totally at a loss. What to do? And it came out that way the next day. This paper actually came out on the morning of the 27th, but obviously the interview was done the previous afternoon. And <laughs> yeah, I am quoted, or. The result was that St. Helens eruption in soon, in quotes. Now, this is not a geologic publication, so soon doesn't mean within hundreds to thousands of years. Soon probably means on a human scale, days, weeks, maybe. Well, if we go back and look at the seismograms now, what went on there, and go forward a day, and it continues, and then the following day, about noon, the first eruption took place. Now this is a small, what's called a phreatic eruption or steam explosion type of an eruption. It wasn't a big deal, but boy, did it get people's attention. For me, that was sort of a little bit of a discouragement, but also relief. Discouragement because we didn't have much monitoring equipment in yet. We'd only put in these portable stations and one telemetry station, but we were trying to put in more all the time. But here, the eruption had occurred. It was all over. What? rats, but relief because now all the focus is down at the mountain and to the volcano hazards experts at Vancouver. And so the press started to leave us alone more and more. Well, just to sort of skip forward to a seismological thing so you can see what we were doing about seismograph stations. Here is Mount St. Helens right in the middle of this 
with SHW, St. Helens West, the seismograph, the only one we had near the mountain up until the 21st of March. Well, very quickly, within 10 days, we had installed 10 more seismograph stations. Some of them are these standalone, locally recording ones in pink. Here's the Spirit Lake Station. And some of them were telemetered, such as the SHW, which had been before, but all these others in purple were now sending their data back in real time to the university for us to see. Well, this continued on through the end of April. Along about that time, we decided this station is really located in a dangerous place, right below the volcano. And we had to go there every five days to service it. So we were going to remove it, but we put in additional telemetered stations. And these three here, one up on the mountain at the Dog's Head, and then at the source of Smith Creek and at Elk Rock. So now we have quite a few telemetered stations and still some locally recording ones. Well, I'll jump forward here just to, so I don't have to show the map again and show you what happened due to the eruption. We lost several of these stations. They were blown away or damaged by mud flows, one or the other. So that's the, sort of the seismograph station story. Well, let's go back and look at a seismogram and you realize that during this period of, of say, mid-April on, the earthquakes are continuing, and they're continuing at a fairly regular rate, and people are starting to get sort of, I wouldn't say bored, but used to this type of thing. In the meantime, the civil authorities, the land managers, the Forest Service, the counties, the state, all were trying to develop plans to protect anyone from what might occur should an eruption happen. And so they generated a restricted area around the volcano. And there's all sorts of pluses and minuses where that should be, how far away. I was not personally involved with those specific discussions, but often was in contact with the volcano hazards people, Don Molino and Rocky Crandall, who were advising the civil authorities on what a volcanic eruption at Mount St. Helens might look like. And then the civil authorities made the decisions on when and how much to close. Well, something else took place during April, during this time, along with these individual earthquakes, there were several periods when we saw sort of continuous shaking going on, as opposed to an isolated event. There's a period of time when for several minutes to even tens of minutes, the ground is sort of continuously vibrating. This we call volcanic tremor, or sometimes harmonic tremor, and it often is associated with eruptions. In fact, the first time we saw this show up on the seismograms, it was when a visitor from Menlo Park, USGS office there, a fellow, Randy White, who had a lot of experience on active volcanoes in Central America and elsewhere. And when he saw this volcanic tremor, he said, the volcano is in eruption right now. Well, it was one evening and I called down to the Forest Service and said, we see signals that look like eruption is going on now. Well, they had an airplane flying around almost continuously looking at what was going on. And they said, nope, it's quiet. Nothing out of the ordinary was going on at that time. So this was very strong volcanic tremor that was not associated with an eruption, sort of a new strangeness. Now, in addition to all this seismology, of course, there's other things, other investigations going on. The petrologists are looking at the chemistry of the ash that is coming out and its characteristics. The gas chemists are sniffing the gases for signs of magmatic gases that come from molten rock. And the geodesists are looking at how the volcano is deforming, looking at deformation. And there's all sorts of sophisticated methods of doing that, but I'm going to show you one that's not very sophisticated. Here again is that photo that I took on the evening of the 21st of March. And I'm going to show you a picture I took on May 1st, about six weeks later, that's roughly from the same place with the same view. And keep your eye sort of on the, on the top here, the, the uh, outline of the volcano. And I'll slowly fade between the two. There you can see this bulge. This whole section of the mountain was expanding outwards and actually the summit area was dropping. So this deformation or change in the shape of the volcano was quite ominous. It was oversteepening in this. And one of the scenarios then developed was 
that this could slide down the mountain. It might go all the way to Spirit Lake and you could generate an eruption that would then come out and generate a blast cloud. That mountain might go five or six miles away. I mean, it could be really devastating. With this in mind, the, the area around the volcano was the closed zone was changed. And there was both a red zone in which only essential personnel were allowed in there, the scientists to do the studies and rescue people. And then there was an orange zone where you could go in during the daylight just to do work if you were approved like for logging. But other people that say own property in this area were excluded. And that generated some issues. There were people that wanted to go into their property, at least to recover things from their homes. Well, on May 1st, we decided we were going to put in a station up here on the dog's head. This is this rock outcrop that's up at about 8,000 feet, some 1,500 feet below the summit. But it's very close to that section of the volcano that was deforming. So we flew up there and spent several hours digging in the ground to plant the sensors and put up an antenna and whatnot. You could say, well, that was probably pretty dangerous. Yeah, it was dangerous. It, was, it felt like it was dangerous. When one of these earthquakes would occur, you'd be standing there and it would feel like it would almost throw you off the volcano. You'd have to squat down and grab a hold almost. So it just made you dig faster and plant your instrument and hook stuff up quicker and then get out of there. Several days later on the 12th, I flew up with a news crew to take a look. Every now and then they wanted someone to go along who was quote, an expert to, that they could interview. And I could tell them about the earthquakes, hardly an expert in actually volcanic activity, but I was learning. And in the process, we could see that it was still steaming and there were these avalanches. You can see a couple of paths of avalanches down. And the crew then wanted to go down to Spirit Lake and talk to none other than Harry Truman, this crusty old fellow that had become somewhat of a folk hero for not taking any of the, the advice from the government to leave, but he was going to stay there because it was his place and he knew what he was doing. The crew wanted to get an interview with me talking to Harry, uh, but I, I didn't want to be involved, so <laughs> I, I always ran around behind the cameraman so I wouldn't be in the scene. Well, as they were packing up and leaving, I did go over and talk to Harry and sort of got a sense in chatting with him that he was thinking actually of leaving. His sister lived somewhere in the area and he thought, well, he'll go down and visit her for a while. But the news media had sort of made a hero of him at this point. And so if he left because of the danger, he'd lose face. And ultimately, of course, he, he didn't leave to go visit his sister and perished. Well, come May 16th, we decided two more stations to put in, one at Elk Rock, some 10 miles to the north, and then Source of Smith, SOS, auspicious name, located just a few miles from Timberline parking lot. And after installing this station, I flew up to the Dog's Head station and I rushed to get it going. Didn't have the final adjustments made just right. So I was there for a very short time, just enough time to get out the equipment and make some adjustments. And here's a photo of the station and the bulge just a few hundred yards away. And the idea here is that if this bulge were to fail, and many landslides do this as they prepare to fail, they slowly start moving before they give way. And in doing so, they might make squeaks and pops and noises that we would seismically record and give us a warning that this was coming. Well, I'm gonna show you the seismogram from this station, from the Dog's Head Station on May 18. And you can see there are lots of little events and a few big events, but there is no obvious change in the number of either of them up until 8.32 in the morning when the eruption starts. And at that time, the, the Dog's Head recorded the beginning of it, and then within 10 seconds, it goes dead. All of this is static. It's like if you suddenly detuned your car radio from a radio station, all you hear is the static or background hiss, and that's what all of this is. So this station was totally destroyed within seconds of the beginning of the eruption. Well, if you look on a larger scale, days ahead of time at a station that's down to the south of St. Helens a little way, so you're not recording uh, all the tiniest events, again, you see no change leading up to the beginning of the eruption at 8.32. Later on in the day, the eruption takes place for many hours 
And this is the seismic record for that. And then later on, after it quits, smaller events die out over the next day or so. Well, as the eruption started, a photo was taken by some geologists flying over it in an airplane and just happened to catch this picture. As you see this section off to the right is the landslide taking off, sliding off to the north. Here's the fault plane that it slips on. This is one part of the total landslide, maybe only a quarter. Another part is in here, and then a still a, a third part is way back up and includes the entire middle of the mountain. So these first parts are really relatively small. If we back off about 10 miles away, a photo taken of this beginning, you can see the landslide material, sort of whitish material going off to the north. And it, at this point, has uncorked a highly pressurized gas-filled magma system within the volcano that starts erupting out. So it's a directed blast erupting definitely toward the north. Well, and later on in the day after it's done its destruction, the volcano then did erupt sort of as a well-behaved volcano should, that is vertically, producing a lot of ash in this case. The ash, of course, was part of the story, but it's not the most hazardous part. Other than to aircraft, it's mostly an annoyance. And of course, there's lots of stories about that. But when it was all over, the devastation area was huge. A huge area going not just 10 miles from the volcano, but more like 20, over twice as far as sort of the worst case scenario up until that point. Well, I was, when this all started, I was sitting at home having breakfast and a fellow from the lab called and said a big event had occurred and he was getting phone calls saying that there was an eruption plume being seen from Vancouver. So I dashed into the lab, started looking at the data. I was really distraught because maybe we had missed something. Quicker review of the, the records that you saw, those types of records, showed that there really wasn't any change. This was sort of the proverbial last straw that broke the camel's back. One more earthquake. In fact, that earthquake may have been that slip. It suddenly took off. I was pretty much devastated by this, and not just because I missed that, but of course, because of the toll it had taken. It had killed 57 people, including a friend and colleague, David Johnston. So the despondency within the lab was palpable. It was a downer for quite a while. It took weeks to sort of recover from that. And just quickly to summarize that, we did start to see changes take place in the seismicity before some of the subsequent eruptions. Again, changes in the types of events and the amount of events took place that we used to anticipate subsequent eruptions. Of course, there's July 22nd and the August 8th one. We did recognize ahead of time and were able to notify the Forest Service and the emergency responders that we thought something was coming. Early on, it was within just an hour or so. Later on, we were able to do so many hours to even days ahead of time. Of course, for the big one, we didn't, at least not on this socially useful time scale. We had two months of warning, but people had almost gotten complacent with that amount. Well, here's the eruption on July 22nd. As I said, we did warn enough people to get out of there. And in fact, some geologists actually went toward the mountain so they could get a better view, but still stayed at a respectful distance. Over the course of the next several years, a dome grew in the crater, each one preceded by some seismic events that we were able to anticipate when that dome would start growing, and then it would quit again. So that was the big story of the major part of the eruption. So to look at sort of parallels with today, in both cases, then and now, science is intimately involved with the developing disaster. Of course, very different scales. For me, it was being involved with watching the data and trying to figure out what was going to happen very much like the medical profession is doing today with the pandemic. There were ambiguities in both cases. The forecasts are based on both looking at what's happened in similar types of situations in the past, both in our case at Mount St. Helens or other volcanoes, currently in other pandemics. How do they progress? What goes on? But at the same time, you're looking at real-time data coming in, trying to interpret those data in terms of how you understand the science progresses. And we definitely 
failed in the case of the May 18 eruption at Mount St. Helens, anticipating it in that narrow window that would have been socially useful to get people out. Maybe it was partial success in that there was an exclusion zone, so not very many people were in, but partly that was luck. It's also a good comparison where the civil decision makers, those that really have to make the hard choices, look to science for getting advice, but they have all sorts of other pressures on them to do things that maybe the science is advising them against. It's a tough, tough place they're in. In both cases, the news media is obsessed with the unfolding story, and often they look to emphasize the controversies the differences between various different scenarios that are put out, or in some cases, looking back, second guessing what had happened before and were there mistakes made. In all cases like this, mistakes are made and they need to be addressed, but not from a blame point of view, but rather from a learning point of view. How can you actually do it better in the future? So it's just a comparison of then and now. In my case, a little bit of difference, but not a lot. So to summarize it up, we in science end up having lots of sort of bells and whistles and models and data types and different inputs that we use to try to figure out what's going on. However, the decision makers, they need a yes, no type of simple certainty. And I'm sorry, you just can't get there from here. Thank you, Steve. That was absolutely fascinating. What a time at Mount St. Helens. We're now going to turn to the final presentation in this webinar tonight, which is Dr. Seth Moran from the U.S. Geological Survey's Cascade Volcano Observatory. Seth is going to give us a little bit of an understanding of what volcano seismology in Mount St. Helens looks like today and in the time period between the 1980 eruption and today, and all the developments in technology and technique and understanding that have taken place in that period of time. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Seth Moran, and I'm gonna be picking up the story that Steve told, picking up the story around the summer of 1980, so after May 18, and go through what's happened at Mount St. Helens in the last 40 years since the May 18 eruption. And in the course of this, I'm going to be showing a figure like this that will be kind of a way of marking time as we go through the presentation. This is a, a plot that shows all of the earthquakes that have been located by the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network over the last 40 years within about a mile of Mount St. Helens, a little bit less than a mile. And it shows time on the horizontal axis going from 1980 on the left-hand side to over here right around last week, April 2020. And the, on the vertical side of things, it shows depth from the surface of Mount St. Helens to sea level and then down to 20 kilometers below sea level. 20 kilometers is about 12 and a half miles. And one of the things that you can see right away in looking at this plot, this is, I should say, one of my favorite plots in all of seismology, is that the time history of earthquake occurrence at Mount St. Helens is not equal. Earthquakes are not occurring on the same place in the magmatic system all the time. And in particular, you can see that there are times when earthquakes are dominantly above sea level, and there are times when earthquakes are dominantly below sea level. Well, it turns out these time periods correspond to when the volcano was erupting or not erupting. For example, 1980 to 1986, there was a series of 20 eruptions during that time period, and the earthquakes were almost entirely above about sea level, maybe one or two kilometers below sea level, with a couple of exceptions. There are this time right after May 18, 1980, when there were very deep earthquakes that went down even below 20 kilometers. And then you can see there are a few little dots here and there afterwards. But for the most part, the vast majority of earthquakes were at or just below sea level and up to the surface. In contrast, after the volcano quit erupting, 1987 to 2004, we went to enter into this time period where deep earthquakes became the dominant story. Earthquakes below sea level going down to about 10 kilometers below sea level. And although there were some shallow earthquakes, it was a much less important feature of the seismicity. Then 2004, Mount St. Helens erupted again, a continuous eruption for a little over three years. And that eruption was accompanied by 
exclusively earthquakes that were just below or at sea level and up to the surface. And then finally, the time period we're in right now, another period of nothing happening at the surface of Mount St. Helens from 2008 to the present. But you can see that over time, earthquakes have been getting a bit deeper mirroring what happened in 1987 to 2004. So there's an interesting story here in terms of what's happening below the surface of Mount St. Helens. And this is also a way that I will guide you in the course of talking through what's happened at Mount St. Helens over the last 40 years, starting with this one time period, 1980 to 86, where there were 20 dome building eruptions. Now, picking up the story from where Steve left it, there were a number of explosive eruptions in the summer of 1980, and some of those started with building of a little lava dome that was then destroyed. But after that first year, what dominantly happened at Mount St. Helens was lava dome building eruptions. There were some explosions, but they were, for the most part, not that big and not destructive to the dome. And what scientists started learning is that if they made measurements in the crater of different types of things that they were observing, these could lead to data points, data trends that could allow them to forecast the timing of the start of an eruption. So here, this, uh, this picture here shows one such measurement. This is a, a thrust fault. This bench up here is the part of the crater floor that's been thrust upwards and is moving over this lower part of the crater floor over here. These two scientists have a tape measure between the two of them and they're measuring the location of this thrust fault over time, tracking its movement. And that's a way of sort of measuring contraction of the surface of the crater. Another thing that was being measured was the width of ground cracks. This is a technique that was uh, imported from Hawaii, actually, where ground cracks are diagnostic of dikes getting close to the surface. Another thing that was used was to track the location of individual points of the Earth to see if they were moving by using something called electronic distance measuring. This involves taking some kind of a laser theodolite type device and shooting it to places where you have reflectors, such as this, which is a target made of highway reflectors, and over time tracking the position of this spot. And this plot on the right-hand side shows the EDM measurement network that was being used to monitor the shape of Mount St. Helens and to see how it was changing, and in particular, how it was changing inside the crater. So it's these kinds of measurements, many of them showed trend lines like this in the buildup to a dome building eruption. So this is, in this case, showing contraction between two points and the vertical axis is in centimeters. This distance right here is a, is a meter. And then the horizontal axis is time, three months, July, August, and September. And what you can see is that these measurements, which were made almost every day, uh, at first there was not much change. And then as time moved on into August, the change got greater and greater and started exponentially increasing. And finally, the rates were so significant, almost uh, you know, half a meter, in this case, one meter in one day. And that rate accelerated until you got to the point where the magma started erupting out of the surface and you had a lava dome eruption. This arrow right here corresponds to a time when a forecast was made based on these changing rates. And the forecast was indicated by this gray box here. That's the time window when scientists said, we think this eruption is gonna happen. So this forecast was made Ah, maybe a week, maybe 10 days before this eruption. And you can see that they, you know, they got it. They got it within the box. And that was uh, one kind of tool. Another trend that scientists observed, scientists like Steve, this is a paper that Steve wrote back in 1983, is that there was a change in earthquake type as you got closer to the eruption. So this is a plot that shows the different types of earthquakes that were being observed at Mount St. Helens back in the 1980s, and you can see there's all these different types, T, H, M, L, S. For the purposes of forecasting at St. Helens, the types of earthquakes that became most important to track were the H, the M, the L, and the S. H means high frequency, which means lots of wiggles per unit time, and there's a time bar down here of 10 seconds. Then medium is medium frequency, and L is low frequency. Here you can see there's a lot fewer wiggles per unit time. And then S, finally, is surface event. And these all had different kind of diagnostic ways that analysts had for picking them out. And one of the things that scientists observed is that as you got closer to the time of eruption, you transitioned from an H to an M to an L. And finally, when the eruption happened, surface events started happening in the form of avalanches and rock falls. This is a plot from Steve's paper that shows another 
technique, another data type that was followed, which is seismic energy release. This is tracked by basically earthquake magnitude. And this is a two year long plot from 1980, 81, 82 that shows seismic energy release curves preceding 10 eruptions during this time period. Each of these boxes up here is a magnification of, in this case, a 14 day time window, 14 day time window. The one over here, this is about a three week long time period. And what you can see in each one of these cases, this curve right here, this dark curve, is that as you got closer to the time of the eruption in the days and week leading up to it, there was an exponential, at some point, an exponential increase in the rate in the seismic energy release over time. And it was that exponential increase, like we saw with the contraction measurements, that really told scientists that you were getting close to an eruption. So, what was being done by University of Washington and by USGS scientists was integrating these different kinds of measurements to come up with successively precise forecast windows for eruptions. So this plot here shows four different data types, the seismic energy release from the previous picture, dome expansion, that's those cracks, inflation, this is measured by tilt meters that were being pushed aside, and then finally sulfur dioxide. We haven't talked about gas, but gas was being monitored as well during this time. And you can see down here in the bottom, this is a horizontal axis going from January 10th to March 19th, or the start of the eruption. You can see that different data sets started seeing early signs that this eruption was going to happen sooner. So first in this case was dome expansion, started seeing little hints of that in say February. Then inflation started picking up into mid-February and maybe got started getting exponential into March. And meanwhile, the seismic energy release really didn't kick into gear until starting to be the middle end of February and then into March, and then it finally got exponential. And what you can see up here are these black bars. These are successive forecast windows that were made at different points in time and they got progressively more precise as different data sets started weighing in with the changes they were seeing. And this final window, really nailed it. It's maybe a day plus or minus for the timing of that eruption. So this is a long-term lesson for volcano monitoring. It's the importance of having multiple ways of monitoring what's happening at a volcano. And the more data streams you can have that are contributing to the overall situation awareness of what's happening at a volcano, the better you'll be able to do at forecasting and at providing interpretations of what is likely going to happen at the volcano to the general public, to land managers, to emergency managers. And that's a lesson that's been learned over and over and over again around the world. So with all of that, this is what was happening at the volcano. These are these different domes, October 1980, June 1981, May 1983, September 1984. There were several eruptions after 1984. And collectively, they built what is now affectionately referred to as the 1980-86 Lava Dome, which is still something that you can see today. So after October 1986, we moved into this period of nothing really happening at the surface. A few explosions in 1989, 90, and 91. But other than that, no magma production, no, no lava eruptions or anything like that. Instead, the focus really shifted to underground and to where earthquakes were occurring at depth. And we'll talk about that time window here a little bit. This is a plot that shows earthquakes located by the PNSN from 1987 through the early 2000s. And you can see that this is depth from the surface down to 17 and a half kilometers. And this is looking from Mount St. Helens, looking to the south. So this would be the east over here, and this would be the west over here. And there are earthquakes that are shallow and going down to about 10 kilometers deep. And as you can see, as you get deeper, earthquakes start to fan out. And in this case, define an area in between them that doesn't have many earthquakes. And one of the inferences that petrologists and seismologists and other, other scientists started coming up with is that this was the marker of where the magmatic system was, where there was probably magma accumulation that had been feeding the 1980-86 eruptions. And these earthquakes were occurring after those eruptions. These are in 87, 88, 9, 90, and so on. 
And the inference from a number of different seismological research perspectives is that these earthquakes were occurring in response to a pressure increase coming from within this area, which right in this figure has a label of a high velocity plug, but there's been different interpretations for what's been going on in here. But the most important thing is that the data, the earthquakes themselves are telling us that they were occurring in response to a pressure increase coming from inside. And the inference that was made back in the mid nineties is that those earthquakes reflected some amount of recharge of magma coming into the system and getting ready for the next eruption. Here's a conceptual model based on petrology of what that magmatic system might have looked like at about seven kilometers depth down to 14 kilometers or so. This is where the, you know, the primary area where magma was stored that fed the 1980 through 86 eruptions. And then there's ideas about different intermediary storage zones that allowed magma to sort of pool up for short periods of time. And then, and then here we have at the surface. The monitoring network between 87 and 2004 was pretty good, thanks to the 1980 eruption. The University of Washington installed 13 permanent stations, and that was one of the best networks in the world on volcanoes for a, a bunch of years. The other kinds of monitoring that were done in terms of continuous monitoring were sort of um, here and there. It wasn't until GPS became a real thing that could be done in an economic way and putting out instruments in the field that wasn't until the mid 90s that that kind of technique was available. Before that, we had to do survey kind of techniques for measuring distances and tracking surface deformation. In the monitoring network in 1998, there was a GPS receiver that was installed here at a place called the Johnston Ridge Observatory operated by the US Forest Service. And they allowed the USGS to put this on top of one of their buildings. There was also a GPS instrument located in the crater. So this first continuous GPS, here it is. This is what the receiver looks like. And this is looking into the crater from Johnson Ridge Observatory. From 1998 through 2004, this is what it saw. So this is the horizontal axis is again time going from 1998 to 2004. And then the vertical axes are displacements, the motion of that GPS receiver in millimeters. So this is zero to 10, that's one centimeter, which is a little bit less than half an inch. And it shows the motion in north directions, in the east direction, and in vertical direction. And although there is wander here and there, there is no net change in the position of that receiver from 1998 through 2004. This is a very important thing. Despite the earthquakes telling us that there was pressure increases and probably some magma coming into the system, starting in 1997, going through 2004, there wasn't any surface expression that could be seen of that from the deformation perspective. And that's one of the interesting questions that's out there about Mount St. Helens still today. So on September 22nd, 2004, what we knew about Mount St. Helens was that there was some seismic evidence for recharge. There was no surface deformation consistent with that recharge, however. We had a conceptual model for how the deep magmatic system might be working and might look, and we had a decent but not perfect monitoring network. And then came the 2004-2008 eruption, which started with an earthquake swarm on September 23rd, about two o'clock in the morning. This shows the first earthquakes. We came in in the morning and uh, saw these earthquakes and watched them increase over the course of the day. And into the next day, they got really, really interesting. And then finally on the 25th, they started dying off. And at this point, this was the only sign that we had seen that the volcano was restless. There were no other obvious surface signs. And this also was reminding us of something that had happened back in 2001. This is a, a two day period of, of seismicity that shows lots and lots of earthquakes, kind of like what we were seeing. And over time, they increased and then they died off. And so that was our idea for what was happening in this case until the next day when we started seeing earthquakes get a little bit bigger and get also more frequent again. And then also hailing back to the patterns that were seen in 1980 to 86, we started seeing a change in the type of event going from high frequency, in this case, what's called volcano tectonic to low frequency in the middle of September 25th, so two days later, and also seeing other kinds of events like these things called hybrids, which were equivalent to the type M's. So this change really caught our eye, and this was when we issued an information statement and also changed color code from green to yellow. What was happening on the GPS side of things, the one, the only continuous GPS instrument that we had out there was the JRO instrument. The one that was on the lava dome 
didn't have any batteries in it, so it wasn't able to tell us what was happening in the crater. But this GPS instrument on JRO finally started showing some actual surface deformation attributable to the volcano on September 23rd. And between September 23rd and October 3rd, it experienced a resolvable change of between 8 and 10 millimeters, so roughly a centimeter. And overall, over the course of the eruption, it changed about two centimeters. And this was motion towards the volcano. It wasn't a vertical change, it was motion towards the volcano. And that was interpreted as being a sign that magma was leaving the magma storage area and moving upwards into the volcano. On, I mentioned this GPS instrument that was on the dome that had been installed back in 2002, occupied periodically throughout the couple years. And this shows the trend lines. The red line is east, the black line is north, the green line is vertical. The only deformation that was being seen was in the vertical channel. And this was downward motion, which was consistent with cooling. The volcano woke up. There were no batteries here. On September 28th, we flew out a scientist to put batteries on that. And in the day following, what we saw was a large change in the position with the station moving to the north on the order of about 30 centimeters or a third of a meter and also moving upwards, roughly about a tenth of a meter. And this was a rapid change and certainly in line with what was happening with the earthquakes it was our sort of first real indication that the dome itself, this was on the 1980-86 dome and that the dome itself was moving up and away from the center of the volcano. So that led to the first explosion on October 1st, which happened eight days after the start of unrest. Pretty short time period for that. And that got us all this buildup, resulted in a parallel buildup in media interest. There were press conferences being, happening at the University of Washington. There were press conferences happening at the Cascades Volcano Observatory. There were lots and lots of media trucks this is a shot that I took from just a little ways north of Mount St. Helens, looking towards the Johnson Ridge Observatory. That's this black circle over here. And you can see this black circle over here outlining a whole bunch of satellite trucks that were there just kind of camped out waiting for an explosion to happen that could be beamed back to news stations. And for people who are working at Mount St. Helens, for scientists who are going out there, this is what you kind of look like as you were driving along the road to and from the, the area that there are people camped on all sides of the road because they were also interested in catching an explosion, sort of a once in a lifetime kind of opportunity. This actually became the big crisis that had to be managed by the land management agency, the Forest Service, because they had people out there in places where there weren't really facilities to support them, no bathrooms, and also emergency services were, were a real question. So this all led up to the first explosion on October 1st. This is a picture of a crew of which I was a part that was installing a seismometer. And when this explosion happened, we were getting ourselves ready to evacuate. So to make a long story short, what happened in the crater can be shown, probably the best way to show it is from this vantage point. This looks like pictures, but they're not pictures. These are a series of digital elevation models made from air photos and things like that. And this first one shows 1986. So this is looking down, north is to the top, south is to the bottom, west and east. And uh, here's 2004, September 2004, before anything happened. Then October 4th, 2004, this is the beginning of the significant deformation on the crater floor. The eruption actually started for real, October 11th. What we mean by for real is that this is when magmatic temperatures were observed at the surface. So we had fresh rock at the surface. And then from then onwards, I'm just going to page through these, we had a series of spines come out to form lava domes, first focused on the southeast side of things and then spreading over to the west. You can also see that this lobe here is a glacier, part of the crater glacier. The crater glacier ice was being pushed off to the side and eventually the lobes moved on to the west and the east side of the 1980-86 lava dome and now they've merged and are down here on the crater floor. And so it continues through 2006 and 2000, 2006 continued through 2007, 2008 and so on. This eruption was accompanied by lots and lots of earthquakes, several million at least, and for periods of time, extended periods of time, they were remarkable. So remarkable, remarkably regularly spaced. This shows 
an entire day recorded on one seismic station. And during this day, the earthquakes didn't vary by much more than a couple of seconds in terms of timing. This was one of the few times in my life when you, I could actually predict an earthquake. And they were so regular that we started calling them drum beats. And it was really, especially for the first year, year and a half, was a dominant form of seismicity. Another thing that happened at St. Helens, this is dominantly a lava dome building eruption, very few explosions, but there were a few. This is a picture taken from a webcam that we had stationed out there that on March 8th, 2005, caught the largest explosion of the time of the eruption. Here, this one on the left is from 525. This one's from 527.42. You can see there's a, a big cloud going up. It's hard to see these impact craters over here, but there were impact craters. This would have been a bad time to be working in the crater, but it would have been otherwise not a problem to be on the volcano. And this kind of thing, there was some sense, a, a little bit of a sense, maybe an hour or two ahead of time from the seismic perspective only, that there was a change in the seismicity. It turned out that that change was because the earthquakes had gotten slightly larger. This was just like a two hour window before it happened. And we didn't make any forecast or any statements about something could be happened because we'd seen changes, short-term changes like this in seismic amplitudes before. And really what this illustrates is that restless and erupting volcanoes can produce explosions with little or no warning. And that's a lesson that's been learned at volcanoes around the world, most recently White Island in 2019, which generated several tens of fatalities of tourists who were caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. That whole sequence generated another lava dome, which we now affectionately refer to as the 2004-2008 lava dome. So in this picture taken in 2007, you can see the 1980-86 lava dome is in the foreground. I'm circling it with my mouse. And then the 2004-2008 lava dome is behind that and I'm circling it with my mouse. It's a broader field tucked behind and butting up against the south side of the horseshoe-shaped crater that was left behind by 1980. So now to end the story, I'm gonna talk about what's happening now. This is, as mentioned before, a time period where the story is not happening at the surface so much, but there's plenty of signs that there are interesting things going on under underground in the form of earthquakes in particular. So the current network at Mount St. Helens is a really, really good network. We've had two eruptions there and that has really helped with resources and also sort of urgent need to install and upgrade equipment as we go. The current network consists of 20 seismic stations, 20 permanent GPS stations, one gas, one real-time gas station, and also we've got webcams and infrasound and water sampling. And this is a network that's jointly operated by several groups, CVO, the PNS end, and a group called the Plate Boundary Observatory. On the GPS network, what's been observed from 2008 to about 2014, these yellow triangles are the locations of these GPS stations. And over the six year time frame, this is showing vectors of motion, horizontal motion. And what you can see is that, you know, here's the volcano. All of these yellow triangles are moving away from the volcano. Not, not by a lot. The scale down here, this arrow, this black arrow is 10 millimeters. So the largest motion is on P703. That's about two centimeters. Most of these are a centimeter or less. It's really, really subtle. And the only way that you see this kind of a signal is to have a network like this on a volcano operating full time year round. So this kind of a thing, a pattern of points in the ground moving away from a volcano indicates, suggests that there might be some pressure increase, some recharge happening at greater depths. Also with the earthquakes. So these deep earthquakes that we, for a variety of seismological reasons, inferred in 1987, 2004, were happening in response to magma recharge. Same kind of thing has been happening with these earthquakes as well. Various seismological indicators indicate to us that earthquakes are recurring in response to a pressure increase coming from within inside that volume I showed you before of the magmatic system where there might be some magma coming in or some fluids coming in and pushing outwards and generating earthquakes as it does. So these two lines of evidence, the inflation source, which is this orange crosshair here, it's a little bit below a, the deflation source that was modeled that was causing the one continuous GPS station at JRO to move towards the volcano once the, when the 2004 eruption began and magma was leaving the system. Now there's an inflation source that is a little bit deeper than that. This is where magma may be coming in. And the 2008, 2014 earthquakes located right in here. And these may be occurring because of fluids coming off from magma coming in at depth or gases, or maybe there's a little bit of magma. There's some unknowns in this, 
but this is the general pattern that we've been seeing. And in 2014, it caused us, the Cascades Volcano Observatory and the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, to issue an information statement stating, among other things, this was on April 30, 2014, and we stated in this is that careful analysis of these two lines of evidence gave us confidence to say that magma reservoir beneath Mount St. Helens has been slowly repressurizing since 2008, since the last eruption, which is a very similar scenario to what happened in 1987. And in the information statement, we further went on to say that this is leading to the next eruption, which is years to decades down the road. This is not a short-term indication of something happening. This is a longer-term warning that's saying, hey, St. Helens is awake, it's alive, and we should be behaving as if it could erupt again because it is certainly moving in that direction, although slowly. So what's going on now? We see periodic times where there is upticks, swarms. This red circle here corresponds to a swarm we saw in 2016, several months long. We put something up on Facebook pages about this. Every so often when we post something about Mount St. Helens on Facebook, it goes viral. And this was one of those situations that wound up on CNN headline news from May 7, 2016, just below a picture of Obama and right next to a story about Canadian wildfires. I'm going to end this talk by just giving you a brief overview, an idea of the status of monitoring at other Cascade volcanoes. We monitor all the volcanoes in the Cascades that have a potential to erupt again. And this plot here shows the numbers of instruments that are installed presently at the different volcanoes. So St. Helens is the gold standard for monitoring in the Cascades as well as around the world. And here's the numbers for it. Uh, Mount Rainier has got a pretty decent network working there to add numbers there, particularly for looking at Lahar detection. Mount Hood has also a, a decent network. We're also working there to improve that. Newbury has a decent network down near Bend. And then things are variable, things start to fall off, and you look at places like Mount Baker, which has just two seismometers, and Glacier Peak, which has one. And those are on our radar in terms of areas that eventually need to be bolstered. What a monitoring station looks like at present is something like this. This is a, a volcano monitoring station at Newbury. This is a GPS antenna that is painted brown so that it blends in with the surrounding territory. Here's an enclosure box that's about five by five by five. A seismometer is buried off underground over here to the right. And then here's a radio antenna that beams all of this data out to a telemetry node off in the distance. And this is all solar powered with batteries and electronics housed inside this enclosure. That's a standard kind of station that's installed at most places in the Cascades, but we do have to adapt. This is our highest elevation site on Mount Rainier. It's in the Sunset Amphitheater at a place called St. Andrew's Rock at an elevation of over 11,000 feet. And this is what it looks like. This site gets buried by 30, 40, 50 feet of snow a year, and it's pretty rough conditions up there, so it has to be engineered in a different fashion to survive. If a volcano wakes up and we don't have the instruments that we need in place at that point in time, we do have a strategy for rapidly deploying things. The strategy evolved from 2004 eruption of Mount St. Helens when we had a couple of stations destroyed in the crater. This is something called a spider that can be deployed by helicopter, and the spider can have a seismometer, can have a GPS antenna, can also be a lightning detector, infrasound for detecting airwaves, and then here is the sling line hook, and this enclosure inside has batteries and electronics and a radio antenna, all for beaming data out. This is not something that we want to count on necessarily, but it is there in case we don't have the instrumentation that we need in place. Because and the last thing I want to say about this is that although the Cascades are you know, sleeping and not frequently active, they do erupt on average about two times a century, and those eruptions are multiple years in length. Mount St. Helens had eruptions between 1980 and 86, and then again between 2004 and 2008. Back a couple centuries ago, Mount Hood had an eruption from 1781 to about 1792, 1793. So when eruptions get going, they can last a long time. And the point is that about 10% of the time, Cascade volcanoes are erupting. And so we need to be ready, it's our job to be ready, the next time a volcano, like Mount St. Helens, chooses to erupt. And with that, thank you for your attention, and I hope you have a good rest of your evening.
All right. Well, with those four fantastic speakers, we thank you so much for having listened in all of this time. I imagine that their presentations have left many questions in your minds. We're actually going to transition now and move over, if you're watching this in real time, to the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network's Facebook page for a Facebook Live event where you can ask any questions that you may have. As this YouTube premiere ends, please jump over to Facebook if you're interested in a question and answer session with our panelists. Thank you so much for listening to this presentation this evening and thinking about what 40 years of science have done at Mount St. Helens and across the Cascade Volcanoes. We wish you a very good evening. Thank you.